And on the international front, Scotland Yard has confirmed an improvised explosive device was detonated on a tube train in southwest London during Friday morning's rush hour. We've got the details of these stories for you here on News 360, including the very latest from the world of sports and entertainment. Remember, you can watch us all across the world on 3news.com and TV3 Ghana on Facebook. Start off with our very first story this evening. 108 Ghanaians have been deported from Benin. The Central Regional Directorate of the National Disaster Management Organization, NADMO, is currently assisting their registration and facilitating their transportation to their hometowns. 108 Ghanaians, including children, have so far been registered by the Central Regional NADMO. Registration and screening is ongoing at Eswesia in the Ekunfi district where the returnees were kept temporarily. Preliminary investigations have revealed that the Ghanaian fisher folk returnees are natives of Abuadze, Dago, Takradi and Kumase. The National Disaster Management Organization has also instituted plans to identify the original communities of each of the returnees towards proper resettlement. More returnees are expected. It will be recalled that TV3 about a fortnight ago carried stories of Ghanaian fisher folk in a Nanyon Akpakpa Dodome, a suburb of the Benin capital Kotonu, who were being asked to vacate the community owing to a national development program. The Ghanaians were supposed to have been evacuated in the last week of July, but for the intervention from the Ghanaian mission in Benin, the exercise was extended to September. And Eric Atta is the Central Regional PRO of, the, of NADMO, the National uh, Disaster Management Organization. And we are going to speak to him on the Benin Returnees Saga. Eric, good evening and thank you for joining us. Good evening, uh, Mr. Money. Yeah, Eric, um, how are you sheltering these people? I, I didn't get you clear, Mr. Money. I am asking... If you are aware, these 180 Ghanaians have been deported from the Republic of Benin, and how you are planning to shelter them back in Ghana? Thank you very much, Mr. Moni. But a, a quick, a quick correction: right. uh, the total number of people uh, received so far is 108. We have received okay. 108 so far, and uh, right. we've been able to identify the communities where originally they lived in Ghana. So what we've been able to do today is that uh, we conveyed all of them from the regional police command to Associa, where they were registered, and uh, not more in collaboration of Ghana Health Service, to be specific, Associa Health Center. We registered all these returnees, we screened them, and afterwards, all of them were taken to their various communities. Are you expecting many more people? Yes, please. We are expecting a total number of 336. As we speak now, the only challenge we have is that we don't actually know when they are coming. To be honest, we received the information last night, 2 a.m. So then we have to respond to it. So now that we have the 108, we are expecting a little over 228 uh, more. Right. So, uh, Eric, can you tell us if the people are just returning on their own volition or they are being forced to return to Ghana? To be honest, they are not returned, uh, I mean, on their own, uh, 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 you know, world. What actually happened, as according to your news that you have, what actually happened is that where they are originally living in Benin, the place has been here marked for a harbor creation. So therefore, uh, the, the government of the Republic of Benin, uh, you know, forced them to come back to Ghana. And uh, the, the land that they were occupying is the land for the Republic. So therefore, they have to do this kind of arrangement uh, with our embassy uh, in Benin. Right. You, you said you've identified some of the communities that they come from originally in, in Ghana. Can you mention a few to us? Yes, please. Uh, the people who came, we had three people coming from Kumase in Asante region. We have four people coming from a community in western region called Abuesi. Then we had uh, uh, the rest, some from Utam, some from Asafa, some from Imuna, some from Gumwadego. 
All right, Eric, we're grateful for your time this morning. Eric Atta is the Central Regional PRO of NADMO, and he's Thank been speaking you. to us on the Benin returnees who have been brought back to Ghana. According to Eric, they've been forced to return back to Ghana. Yes, so let's turn attention to other stories now. As another person suspected to have been involved in the murder of Major Maxwell Adams Mahama has been arrested and put before the Accra Central District Court. Emmanuel Baden was arrested at Edbu in the western region, Ghana, and between the Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire borders. Emmanuel Baden is a bricklayer from Dinchraboasi who is suspected to have been involved in the murder of Major Mahama. This brings to 21 the number of persons standing trial for the murder of the military officer. The presiding judge, Walanyo Kutuku, adjourned the case to September 25 after the prosecutor, DSP George Amega, requested for more time as investigations were still being carried out. The 21 accused persons, including the assembly member for Denchabwase, William Ba, and one female, Vivian Asahine, have been charged with murder and conspiracy to commit murder. The police are still on a manhunt for 12 others suspected to have been involved in the lynching of the military officer. Raj, President Okufado has received the first Ghana card to signal the official rollout of the national identification system. And the card is expected to replace sectoral ID cards and will be the only mechanism to, to, for transaction where identification is required. The implementation of the National Identification Project is a long-held MPP campaign pledge to build a database of Ghanaians and other nationals resident in Ghana. The aim of the project is to establish an integrated data warehouse of databases from key public institutions using the identification system as a unique identifier for data items and automating the processes involved in assessing public services at both national and local government offices. It is also to enhance policy planning and implementation. Within a year from now when every Ghanaian in Ghana and every Ghanaian abroad has been given the opportunity to register for the Ghana card in the first instance for free and you fail to do that, you would not be able to access certain services, facilities and opportunities that are customarily available to the public. President Ekufado, who received the first card to signal the official rollout of the project, enumerated the importance of the card in promoting national development. With a 128 kilobyte capacity, the Ghana card will enable other stakeholders to run their applications on the national identity card. Ultimately, the card will replace the sectorial identity cards in circulation and shall be the only card to be used in transactions where identification is required as provided by law. He argued it is better to keep sensitive digital data with the NIA than allowing other institutions to do same. Assigning the collection and custody of biometric traits to a single institution is safer and in line with current trends. By statute, the NIA is under obligation to ensure the accuracy, integrity, confidentiality, and security of data it collects. The president earlier inaugurated a 10-member governing board of the authority to oversee the implementation of the project. Meanwhile, President Ikufuajo is leading Ghana's delegation to the 72nd session of the United Nations General Assembly in New York tonight. The president is scheduled to deliver his maiden address on Thursday, September 21, and would also hold a meeting with UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres. While in the U.S., the president will also engage in a series of sustainable development goals meetings in his capacity as co-chair of the advocacy group of eminent persons. And private developers who have put up buildings along the catchment areas of the Owabi and Barikesi Dams have been given one week to produce their permits 
or have their property demolished. Now, the move is to save the two dams from imminent collapse. A report by Benjamin Edu. The dam, constructed almost 90 years ago, was designed to produce 3 million gallons of water daily to supplement the Barikesi Dam, which produces 21 million gallons daily. The facility, however, produces 2 million gallons following massive encroachment on the site. More than 3,000 acres of the 4,250 acres of reserved lands along the banks of the dam have been encroached on. The Barikesi Dam faces a similar threat. Private developers are the main corporates here with buildings at different stages of completion. The acting regional manager in charge of production, engineer Charles Tulasi, appealed to the authorities to intervene to save their situation. The tributaries are also gradually dying. The river source is also reducing, is dying, yes. All water that we need to treat uh, well, it will be difficult to get uh, the way things are going. So we would plead with all the stakeholders, the press, to help us to prevent this from going on. The Deputy Ashanti Regional Minister Elizabeth Ajiman gave a one-week ultimatum for developers to produce permits or risk demolition of their structures. Ask anybody who is putting up a structure here to produce his or her permit. If they can't produce it after one, we have to pull everything down. Because we cannot sit down and wait for this to go on. The Minister of Environment, Science, Technology and Innovation, Professor Kobinafrin Pomboatin, warned of a looming water crisis in the country if drastic measures are not put in place. Now, some residents of Impoise near Dansuman have begun relocating following the Sanitation and Water Resource Minister's five-day ultimatum to forcefully evict them. A team of military and police officers have been deployed to facilitate their immediate eviction. Minister for Sanitation and Water Resources, Joseph Kufiada, on a tour of Impoise Thursday, issued a five-day ultimatum to residents to leave following the poor sanitary conditions and lawlessness there. The sector minister again said some structures accommodating the residents will be demolished without compensation to victims, adding the intended exercise will enable easy access of trucks to the dumping site when time is due for reclamation of the land. It's two days into the five-day ultimatum and some residents are worried. There were signs Friday morning that some residents were ready to relocate, however. Five days. I, days. I, 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 I am not prepared to relocate because the five days ultimatum is inadequate. I don't even have money for transport. Another resident admits they are illegal settlers but have to be considered. This is not the state we came to meet. Our streets have led to the poor sanitation condition here. Meanwhile, a team of security personnel have been deployed to the community to ensure private commercial garbage collectors halt dumping at the site. The demolition is scheduled for Monday, September 18. Now let's talk about Free Senior High School. Uh, the board chairman of the Ghana Education Service, Michael Nsungwa, has blamed the congestion associated with the Free Senior High School placements to heads of schools who under declared vacancies in their schools. Now he, however, gave an assurance the GES has put in place measures to provide logistics and facilities to resolve any challenge. Katrin Fimpoma was there for TV3 News. Most school heads have complained of having received more students than they can admit. A situation they lament is putting pressure on their limited facilities. This, according to the board chair of the GES, is coming as a surprise. All this information have come too late and it's looking like we didn't know. So then, well, would you agree that maybe your, uh, your, your team also did not do what you were supposed to do in gathering this information because we shouldn't be hearing of these things now. The, the minister met all heads 
in this country three times in Kumasi. Three times. And we were given prepared format to fill with all the information that is required to enable them to function properly. And if you don't have it on the sheet, which were captured and put into the computer, and now you are telling me you don't have this, you don't have that, uh, it becomes difficult for us to understand uh, how you are managing your school. He said most of the heads of the various schools underdeclared the number of students they could enroll, creating the impression they are being overburdened. Today, for instance, the headmaster of Agri Memorial is um, being summoned to uh, Accra to answer why. No, the, the students who went out, we are only replacing students who went out. Thousand students went out, and you declare about 700. So if you are not careful, the temptation is that you will fill the, uh, and then the problem, that, that will be even worse, because that is the figure we've used for our budget. Mr. Nsoa said the GES was ready to assist the schools with the requisite facilities and logistics to make the free SHS program successful. Whatever it is, as and when the, these reports come, the ministry is taking action to make sure that the children or the students are comfortable in their schools. If it is this, yes. If it is, uh, I know some, some of these schools have, uh, through the GET Fund, they have uh, been uh, provided with buildings and so I personally went to some schools. The buildings are almost complete. If I painted and everything, it needs more, more, uh, some money to fix uh, other gadgets. And this will be taken care of. The In other news, government is considering floating bonds to offset the 80, the 80 months arrears owed members of 12 labor unions. Reacting to concerns raised by the unions, Minister of Employment and Labor Relations, Ignatius Bafo Iwa, said other financial instruments would also be considered to raise the required funds. The unions accused government and the National Pensions Regulatory Authority for not transferring their funds. About 2.7 billion cities, which was lodged at a temporary pension fund account, TPFA, at the Bank of Ghana, is expected to have accrued 1.2 billion cities as interest. At a news conference, the 12 labor unions alleged the money cannot be traced. However, the sector minister, Ignatius Bafuewa, indicated that government was yet to conclude auditing of the TPFA to trace the funds. He said government was considering floating bonds and other instruments to pay any arrears owed the unions. Currently, government owes 80 months arrears to the unions. The high yielding, it should be risk-free, yeah. and if possible, it should be an instrument that can easily turn into money okay. so that um, if you have a liquidity constraint for, and uh, you have to meet some demands which are very critical, you can easily transfer or change some of these instruments to money. For me, those are the requirements that they should meet. The sector minister promised a meeting with aggrieved unions before the end of the ultimatum. The funds are not government's funds. They, they belong to the unions. So if anything at all, we are holding them in trust for them. So if they demand it, I personally don't see anything wrong with that request. Ever since I assumed this office, we've worked together. Um, if there were issues that merited certain date lines, I, I, I was expecting perhaps there, there should have been an engagement. And now, findings by the Health Services Workers Union have cited SNIT for reducing benefits of retirees by 42% from the lump sum. Their study again revealed that some pensioners were paid 3,000 cities only instead of 27,000 cities after 40 years of public service. The Health Services Workers Union covered more than two years. It identified that pensioners do not receive their full contributions when they retire. It alluded that SNIT does not use the formula on annual salary and annuity factor to calculate benefits for pensioners. This, according to the union, has affected benefits of contributors who have consistently complained to the unions. But SNIT has come out of their own flyer that if you retire at 55, 
you receive 60% of your benefits instead of 100%. And in the constitution, you can retire voluntarily at, at 45 years. Capital you can retire at 45 years. You don't apply any early, any early retirement reduction factor. This is a creation of Senate. It's not backed by any law. Again, the findings identified that Senate reduced by 42% the lump sum of contributors after active service. It stated that a midwife who retired last year was paid 3,000 cities instead of 27,000 cities after 40 years in public service. Sometimes they will say uh, uh, benefits are low because salaries are low. It is not true. That somebody who should have been paid 76,000 Ghana cities as lump sum, but he was paid 30,000 as lump sum because that another salary that they picked was wrong. Annuity factor 2 was used. Which is illegal. The union has therefore petitioned the National Pensions Regulatory Authority to call Senate to order. We also want organized labor to look into this matter critically when they come out uh, with their uh, findings so that Ghanaian workers will get what they are legally entitled to. Well, it's still live on News 36. You've got the latest of news for you from the world of business shortly. Stay with us. You're watching News 360, Time for Business. My name is Nanikia Mensah-Brampa. First Deputy Governor of the Bank of Ghana, Dr. Maxwell Afari, says the central bank has begun talks with the National Insurance Commission to cut down on the bottlenecks associated with licensing new insurance companies. He was reacting to complaints by insurance providers of the numerous processes and procedures before obtaining operational permits. According to insurance providers, the duration of licensing spans between two and six months, a situation which has contributed to the low insurance penetration in the country. But Dr. Maxwell Opoku Afari says the regulators have begun talks to address the challenges. We have to make sure that if there are any undue bureaucratic processes that delays the approval of licenses, we will try to address that. But in addressing that, we also want to make sure that we do not relax the fit and proper test and the due diligence that one has to go through to be able to approve to do that kind of business. Lead financial services strategy and operations at KPMG, Robert Jato, expects enforcement of regulations in the sector to promote efficiency. We need to innovate on products. take care of uh, so some product innovation will be crucial but even more importantly is the service experience and insurance um, companies and banks as well need to put service experience at the heart of what they do head of unibank's bank assurance ludwig kisiedu indicated that increased education on insurance in the country is key Currently, what the regulation states is that if you are a bank and you're doing bank assurance, you can have one company, one non-life company, and one life company. But we want them to open it up so customers can have a choice you know, uh, to bring competition in the bank assurance sector. We think that if that is done, it could also drive the premiums down you know, for more people to sign up to uh, the insurance products. The concerns were raised at the third annual bank assurance and alternative distribution channels conference. The event was on the theme Innovation, Reinventing Insurance for the Digital Generation. Let's move to the oil and gas sector where Africa consultants for the Natural Resource Governance Institute, Emmanuel Kuyole, is advocating a proper management regime in the mining industry. Now, he urged, uh, he argued challenges in the sector clearly confirms how unsustainable the country has managed the mining industry. Speaking on the sidelines of the policy seminar on local content and value realization in the extractives sector in Accra, Emmanuel Kuyole suggested lessons from the oil and gas sector be brought to bear on the mining sector. 
This, he indicated, would enhance governance and sustainable development in the mining sector. To some extent, the challenges we are having in the small, uh, small scale uh, sector, the issue of galamsey and the pollution of the of the environment are all you know very negative indicators of how we have not managed the mineral sector very very well and so going forward the challenge really will be how we learn some of the good lessons from the oil and gas sector and we sort of bring them into into the into the mining sector to bring improve on the governance of the mining sector participants comprised of experts in various fields from extractive countries in sub-saharan africa Local content officer at the Petroleum Commission, Abdul Karim Adam, hinted on a comprehensive study within a year to be informed on what needs to be amended in the local content legislative instrument 2204. The value chain audit to really understand where we are as a country and where we are in terms of the local content compliance levels so that we'll be able to inform government and we'll be able to inform you know, a, a policy decision on where we are when the law comes into Parliament for amendment in five years' time. An August 2017 report by Africa Centre for Energy Policy on achievements, challenges and the way forward for Ghana's local content regulations recommends that government amends the regulations to bridge the salaries and wages gap between expatriates and Guinean employees as practiced in Angola, Middle East and North Africa. Executive Director of ASEP, Benjamin Boache, is of the view that the value chain process in the oil and gas business can raise the funds and technology required to be active in the industry. Local content helps bridge uh, uh, that uh, gap uh, by training and also by transferring skills and technology and some businesses to local uh, uh, entities and regulations to ensure that there are processes of ensuring that we set targets and meet those targets over time and increase Ghanaian participation uh, in the industry. Oh, I saw that will do for business tonight. My name is Nanikia Mensa Bampa. Isa is standing by with more. Thank you, Nanikia. And the Dean of the Centre for International Education and Collaboration at the University of Professional Studies, Accra, Professor Goskialavi, is advocating an educational reform to inculcate practical skills training in the curricula. This, she believes, is the first step towards fighting graduate unemployment in the country. She was speaking at a conference on graduate unemployment in Ghana. To start with, who wants to choose a TVET system, a vocational school or a technical school? These are the questions we've got to be asking ourselves. And I challenge the governments of Africa to invest in the TVET system because it is the technical and the vocational system that can help emancipate Africa from the economic crisis in which we find ourselves right now. All we know and have come to recognize in our educational system is paper. So we prefer people with qualification without any experience to teach in our tertiary institutions. Yet we expect that when the students graduate, they will come and help contribute value to the economy. But theoretical knowledge is not practical knowledge. There is a big difference in the two. So we need to consciously bring practical orientation and practical knowledge to bear in a very simplistic manner, in a manner that works for us to transform our educational system. Over and again, industry has indicated that the jobs are not available. Africa produces 
about 10 million graduates in a year. And out of this 10 million graduates, about 50% of them do not have jobs. Now, for the few jobs that are available to get the students or graduates into, they do not have either the required skills or the required competences or the work attitudes. Hmm. Well, in a topic related to this issue, the Board for the Youth Employment Agency has been inaugurated with a call to roll out more modules to reduce youth unemployment in the country. The board is expected to create more jobs to complement the efforts of government. It is to roll out other modules to meet the growing demand for employment. Current figures from the statistical service indicate youth unemployment has shot up from 5 to 12.5 percent. This the sector minister described as alarming and touched the board to be proactive. Yes, we may have low figures when it comes to unemployment, but when it comes to underemployment, there are people who work, but the work they do cannot be, in a real sense of the word, cannot be classified as what? Work. And these are the people who will be coming to you for help. Board Chairman Samia Wuku pledged to deal with what he termed institutional rot and corruption, which has bedeviled the YEA. This institution being a job creation vehicle, and we as members of the board would like to assure all stakeholders including you, Mr. Minister, that we will not that we will complement the effort of our president in delivering on his job creation agenda. Dara News and transportation is expected to receive a major boost as the country has received 30 buses from the Turkish government. The 34-seater Mercedes-Benz buses were donated to fulfill a promise made by the president of Turkey, Rajab Tayyip Erdogan, when he visited Ghana in March last year. Six years after the reopening of the Turkish embassy in Ghana, the relations between the two countries has remained cordial. This has been characterized by high-level official visits between the two countries, with issues of migration and employment being key among discussions. During his last visit to Ghana, President Erdogan joined former President Mahama to cut sword for the official commencement of work on a new terminal building at the Kutuka International Airport and promised his government support towards transportation in Ghana. Minister for Local Governance and Rural Development, Hajia Halima Mahama, who received the buses and has called the need for their proper maintenance. Our concern is when they pick up the vehicles and run them, whatever process they get from it, it should be used for the maintenance of the vehicle. Of course, they will have to pay the drivers and the conductors who will be running the vehicles, but would ensure that they open an account, put part, some of the proceeds in for maintenance of the vehicle. Maintenance is key. Ambassador of Turkey to Ghana, Nizreen Bayazet, is optimistic the buses would facilitate easy transportation in Ghana. I promise that uh, Istanbul uh, Metropolitan uh, Municipality uh, will uh, donate buses to, uh, for the use of public transport in Ghana. So we've worked on that project and I'm, I'm so pleased that finally it came to an end. And uh, we hope that this will be useful for the people of uh, Ghana. We know that there is great need in public transportation. In addition to the buses, it's a 30-footer container full of spare parts. Well, you're still watching News 360. You've got the latest from the world of sports with Thierry Nian shortly. Stay with us. Hi, good evening, and it's time to bring you all the latest in the world of sports right here on News 360 with me, Thierry Nia. Now we start off with Rafael Germina. Now the FC Zurich striker has confirmed that, uh, you know, he, uh, you know, has been cleared by doctors to resume training and uh, his career after health concerns blocked his proposed move to the English Premier League. 
um, have uh, been cleared. Now, all those concerns have been cleared according to the statement that he released earlier today. The 21-year-old has not played since the proposed move to Brighton fell through over a failed medical, but the club says he has been past fit to continue playing. The Black Stars forward had earlier said that uh, he's had a chip uh, implanted um, that will monitor his heart for some time. Now, Jamina had been set for what he called a dream move to the English Premier League with Brighton after scoring 17 goals, uh, you know, in 25 games for FC Zurich before concerns about his uh, health stopped the move. Now, he suggested he is over the disappointment of the failed move. Uh, you know, and I quote, God is good. He holds our future. He knew why he closed this transfer. I believe he is not done with me yet in Switzerland. All right, so away from that man, we go straight to the under-17 side, the Black Starlets. Now, they held their first training session in Abu Dhabi, where they uh, have pitched camp for their final preparations towards the under-17 FIFA World Cup. The under-17 uh, team checked into the pack in, uh, you know, after arriving in the early hours of Thursday. After some good rest, the team moved out to the Mohammed bin Zayed Sports Stadium, located inside the New York University, Abu Dhabi. The facility has been secured by the team throughout the uh, their camping days. Now, all 25 players were involved in the training session, which was largely a recovery uh, session for Parkway Fabian and his boys. Now, it's expected, uh, you know, Parkway Fabian himself is expecting to test his side with two international friendlies against some of the under-17 World Cup campaigners who are also heading to the United Arab Emirates for their preparations. All right, so now we're from Dallas to do some more football because uh, there have been some still, uh, still there have been some uh, waffle games currently uh, ongoing in Cape Coast. Remember, it's a tournament that is to unite all the West African nations. Ghana were able to top their group uh, that consists of the likes of Mali, Guinea, and Nigeria. But today, Niger, uh, uh, you know, and their likes have also been, uh, you know, playing and. Uh, Th those games are currently ongoing. We'll definitely bring you developments of those uh, particular games. But let's move on from there. Let's go straight to Koloture. And now he says he couldn't be happier after returning to Celtic to join the club's coaching staff as a technical assistant. The former Ivory Coast captain made 17 appearances for Celtic last season before ending his playing career to focus on coaching. He called the appointment a new chapter in his career. In his new role, the former Arsenal, Liverpool and Manchester City defender will be supporting uh, on all first-team coaching matters and using his knowledge to assess Celtic's various youth levels. All right, so now to the world of boxing then. And before we bring you the GGG and Canelo fight, this is the one between Senna Agbeko and his American compatriot uh, Brad Austin at the State's Fairground Sports Arena in Nashville, USA. Agbeko and Brad made their weight on Thursday ahead of tonight's uh, battle, billed for six rounds. Yes, just six rounds. Now, Senna Agbeko gained three straight victories on his return from a three-year break after losing the technical knockout to Raymond Jatika in 2014. All right, so to some international boxing then. And this particular bout has been billed as the biggest and the best, of course, in this era. I'm not sure what it beats. Does it beat Anthony Joshua and Vladimir Klitschko a few months ago? Or does it beat Mayweather and, uh, you know, uh, Manny Pacquiao just some two years back? Or does it even beat Mayweather and, uh, you know, uh, McGregor just a few weeks ago? This one is between GGG, I'm talking about uh, Golovkin and uh, Alvarez Canelo. Now, this particular fact, or so these facts, will guide you looking forward into that particular bout.
I know this is the biggest day for us, not for us, for boxing, for this area. All right, so those are some of the things you should look out for when, uh, you know, Gennady Golovkin and uh, Canelo Alvarez uh, face off in the ring that is just a few hours from now. We definitely will be keeping an eye on that one as well and bring you every bit of detail as and when it does happen. My name is Thierry Vignon, and thanks for joining me. You're on News 360, and uh, we have the story coming through now. The National Democratic Congress, NDC, has gone through several difficulties in the past eight months uh, since it's been in opposition. Several issues are coming up about the leadership of the party and how they are going to organize themselves to win the 2020 election. We have the former president, Jerry John Rawlings, on the phone. So we're going to speak to him to find out a few issues that are of concern to him and how the party is going to organize itself for the 2020 election. Mr. President, it's good to speak to you. Good evening and thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Right. So um, what can the NDC do right now to organize itself for the 2020 elections? There are quite a few things that need to be done. However... <coughs> Let me simply say that I would very much want to see the NPP beaten. But do we have what it takes? Do we have the capacity to be able to wrestle power from them in their midstream? That's the issue we should be addressing. We should be looking at this question a lot more seriously than we've done so far. That's it. Right. You, you, yes. you, you are a former president, the leader of the party. At the mm -hmm. moment, what do you think can be fixed right now to make the NDC ready to win the 2020 elections? Quite a few things, but uh, the most important factor, I believe, has to do with the issue of the cleanup that needs to be done. The restoration of our integrity. We don't like to hear it. But I keep repeating it. We have to go back, seize the moral high ground. And I believe we know what we have to do. Okay, but I don't think we're prepared to confront it. Or oh, that's what I've noticed about some of our people. Yes. So, uh, Mr. President, how about the grassroots of the party? I mean, we have recognized that the NDC relies so much on the influence of the grassroots or what we call grassroots politics to win elections. Are they involved in this clean up that you are talking about? If we would involve them, I'm sure they could ensure it. They could help us clean up. But uh, the manner in which the electoral process has been happening since Sunyani you know, has not been encouraging, you know. It's unfortunate, most unfortunate. That's how come we lost the moral high ground. I think they know what needs to be done. Hmm. We have been following the discussions after the NDC lost power in the 2016 elections, and there seems to be some disaffection from the grassroots. How are you going to bring them on board and give them the confidence that they require to really fight for the party to come to power again? Well, the point is to embark on the empowerment process. Let's give back the party to them. They are the ones who actually make it possible to win or lose elections. Let's respect their views. Let's respect their pains, their sensitivities. You know, let's get back to, and when I say the moral high ground, it's about time we stop using the, the money factor. Let's get back to the respect of our values. You know? Yep. 
So, uh, you Mr. can't Pres use money to buy anything <laughs> and everything. Yeah, I reckon that. But how yes. do you reconcile the top hierarchy of the party now to recognize that they need to come together to get this victory you're talking about? Yes, we need to come together. But around personalities or around issues, you know, around values, I think that is what will make the difference. Let's get back. Let's unite around the old values. Then I think we'll be making some progress. All right. That was the former president, Jerry John Rawlings. He's been speaking to us on his concerns about reorganizing the NDC to take back power in the year 2020. We're grateful for your time, Mr. President. Thank you for speaking to us. We're still live on News 360. Let's take a look at what's making news on the international front. Scotland Yard has confirmed an improvised explosive device was detonated on a tube. Tr and on this segment tonight, enterprise, enterprise in playwright, Kobna Ansa of I Want to See God Fame is inspiring young talents not to give up on their dreams, even when they go in get stuff. Now, his streetism-themed play, Tribeless, motivates starters to follow their passion and chase their dreams. This is what also Rai has been finding out. No, I know. You see, it's one of those wild dreams. Men are idiots. Men are foolish. Men are goats. If men are goats, have you fed your father grass today? Life presents a lot of challenges that sometimes lead to a feeling to give up. Kobina Anser's forecast musical play, Tribeless, considers that as a defeatist mentality, motivating the youth to persevere until their dreams are realized. Tribeless explores the hustle of four ambitious ghetto friends, a trotro conductor, pickpocket, a head porter and a hawker. Blessed with unique artistic talents, the friends form a music and dance band and enter into a competition hoping to turn their fortunes around. Just as breakthrough stirs them in the face, conflict sets in, threatening their dream. See, sometimes um, people work together as a team and do so well, but um, sometimes we have our, our, personal, our personal differences and immediately they set in, then we should know that the group is going to break apart. And um, that's what we see in Tribalists, where one person thinks they are better than the other, where, where one person thinks it's because of them that the, the group is thriving. We have setbacks in life, in all that we do, and that's what Tribalists is focusing on. No matter the setbacks that we come across in our, in our daily activities, we should keep on moving. For now, the answer to what became of the group is unknown. Tribalists is excitement filled. Millicent Abatete played Ya Gaddafi, a tomboy, a trotro mate and a dancer. My voice will change and the way I will walk, the way I relate, there should be that man-like thing in me. Charlie, so sorry as I would do, you know, if you qualify. What be that? See, I really want Sean this thing, you know. See, you know, hear what the judge talk me. He say I be make I go find some football team and play. See, I swear that woman day my body. They will go take my brace, I do praise and worship for a face stop. Eh? <laughs> Catch the fun, the betrayal, the nervy moments and the suspense at the Ifwa Sutherland Drama Studios at the University of Ghana on September 16 and 17. The big question, however, is what happened to their hard-fought struggle. I think that's an interesting line there, very using Brazia to do prison. <laughs> yeah, that was almost. a good Is it to slap her face? I guess so. Yeah, it's very quite <laughs> vulgar, but interesting. <laughs> <laughs> that's it for this edition of News 360. My name is Lisa Mami. And I'm Natalie Fort. We've got more news on our website, 3news.com.